I don't want to see my children like grow up with like oh what is this that they take a look from the book you know at least they can test it by themselves so if they get inspiration from that or if I have chance to to tell my uh, my team like the young generation how important preserve the, um, the, the local wisdom and the um, local ingredients if they carry that message or philosophy. This is like my, 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 my last mission that like pass it through like the young generation and, and it depends on them that like, okay, I got it chef and I can take it or they can just like ignore it. It's, it's up to them. So, I mean, Thailand really is made up of a kaleidoscope of cultures and flavors woven into a patchwork that really encompasses Thai cuisine. A lot of the food that we eat around the dinner table is very heavy on the pork, heavy on the bitter herbs and greens, and a lot of sticky rice and salty, very pungent, deep umami flavors. I think Chef Noam is, I don't know if you should say revolutionary, <laughs> but yeah, I guess you could. What he's doing is taking ingredients that are common to the Isan person and the Isan diet, the Isan culture, and then putting them in a way in which he's challenging let's say, uneducated Bangkokians how to eat his own food and saying, look, this is a great product, it should be valued just because you think it's fucking weird doesn't mean it is weird. It's, it's something we've been eating for centuries here and it's something that we value and really respect, so maybe I sh you should too. And the way he shows that with such pride and skill is what makes, I think, him stand out from other cooks in the region. That's like the, some court that um, talking about like Isan people that like them. Isan people eat everything that can move, you know, so, which is true. That's the way that like we enjoy it and then we use the, the creativity and then become like the wisdom, you know. My name is the Noom, Virawattu uh, Yasenawat, so then you can call me Chef Noom. Um, head chef and then also the owner of the Samu and Sons. The restaurant has been here almost 10 years. The Samu and Sons like uh, focusing on the local Isan ingredients and then we used like a, a different technique um, to approach into that ingredient and then uh, represent in the uh, um, new Isan cuisine. Sun food is different to other parts of Thai cuisine. Thai cuisine all has sort of similarities that share similar food cultures, but then the sun food for me, in general, has a little bit more of a robust, intense flavor than, say, Central Plains, where it's more coconut based. There's not so much coconut in sun food, if, if any, really. The biodiversity that they're consuming is much bigger than what people would assume. The amount of different dishes that Nissan people eat is truly phenomenal. Basically, like when people think of like Isan food, they always thinking of um, papaya salad or sometimes uh, the barbecue chicken or like gaiyang, the barbecue pork like muping, you know, lab, uh, some kind of like uh, hot and sour soup. But um, to me, Isan cuisine means like the the food that available um, through all of the this region. My day start with like uh, think of like the the desperate material girl that go to shopping mall, you know. I'm a guy like that. 
when I go to like the morning market, you know, so everything looks cool and like most of the time I have to stop myself like, okay, wait a minute, chef. You don't know yet how to use it, but it looks so cool. So for example, in this morning, I don't know what to do with that, but like I got to grab it, you know, because what I like about the morning market is like, you don't know that tomorrow is gonna be valuable for you or not. Sometimes it's not good when you think of that, you know, because which means that like, you're gonna buy a lot. So um, I would say walking through the, 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 the morning market, you get inspiration, you get information, and then talking to the people in the market, you got the idea, you know. I've been here for years, you know, and then the, um, they start to know everyone here, mm -hmm. but not like the, every name, but like uh, they know me and then I know them. For example, like we make some kind of like curry or broth yeah. with the, um, the fish. Yeah. We just like dump like lots of ants into the soup wow. and it turns sour. Crazy. No wow. man. Natural the traditional technique. Yeah, yeah, amazing. yeah. Well, I mean like this is like what's, um, this is like Isan food all about, mm -hmm. you know, it's like you, it's clean. It's straightforward, it's rustic, and then you still can taste the, the each flavor that you put into the dish. Yeah. But like, um, this day, it's covered by like the seasoning. Mm -hmm. the people tend to um, season like Isan food, like spicy food flavor. Yeah. yeah. It's sad to me. I think the reason that Isan people aren't recognized so much for their food is because of pure snobbery. There are a lot of Thai people who think that Thai cuisine has to come from the palace. And that was the case for many years for the central Thais. The, the recipes that came and were disseminated out to the general public flowed downwards through the palace kitchens. So a lot of the great dishes like green curry that you have on the menu today came thanks to the dignitaries who came to the palace to visit and the ingredients and cooking techniques that they influenced the, the palace cooks to, to try out. That's how we got chilies. That's how we started putting coconut milk in our curries. Um, that's how we got just about every ingredient of note in the Thai culinary lexicon. Uh, there are very few ingredients that you see on a menu today that are purely Thai, except for maybe peppercorns. Thailand has been able to take influences from all over the globe and mix them in such a way as to make it their own. Uh, thai people are really good at that. Uh, my philosophy um, try to work more on local wisdom and one day if we practice enough if we experiment enough and then those kind of things become like information when you fully focus on one region we have more creativity you know because you have limited uh, resources so then what you have to do just like using the technique using your um, creativity make that ingredient shining more and more. If you're talking about like the local ingredients, back in the day before monopoly uh, agriculture, Isan people rely so much on the seasonal product that grow naturally, which means that like um, foraging stuff, it's a part of um, our life, you know? Like when, so then we grow rice, of course, as the staple food, but, you know, when we need something to eat along with the rice, we can go to the forest nearby the rice field. We can pick up some shoot that uh, grow from like the big tree. And we can find like fish, like small insects. We can turn it into the dish then to have it with like sticky rice.
But right after the mo monopoly plantation occur, it affect the way that people live in here forever. We have less forest, and then um, we just can't rely on the seasonal ingredient anymore, you know, because it's very limited now. We're talking about like sustainability, you know, and then sustainability all also comes with like biodiversity. If we don't preserve it, and then if we allow like the monocrop, monopo uh, monopoly plantation occur the whole world. So we just, I don't know how, 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 how to live anymore. Well, I think biodiversity is the only thing that's really important in our food systems right now, because biodiversity has been proven to be a more healthy, resilient system. Uh, it allows us to eat a variety of different nutrients at different times of the year. It keeps the soil healthier. It uh, also helps with the biodiversity of animals and other things. So if we start like taking away the biodiversity, we're taking away our own health system. And so I think for me, biodiversity is the strongest argument for a healthy food system. And I think it's also a way in which we can sell a healthy food system people by saying look this is biodiversity this is amazing this is what this region has to offer and that's how we can localize things one of the things that like uh, um, people people know about us is like eating insects you know uh, at um, summer and suns like we we don't serve them as like the whole insect but like we use like fermentation technique and turn those insect to become like the seasoning product uh, for example that like <clears throat> we use like specific type of the cricket and turn it into garum which is like the people know it as like fish sauce but instead of using fish <clears throat> we use the um, cricket and turn it into like you know the sauce that you can enhance the flavor and we tend to season that with the uh, ant egg, you know, fresh ant eggs. So then you just like quick branch it, and but still pop in your mouth. You dress it with the um, the cricket sauce, add a little bit of toasted rice powder and chili flakes, and then you you can enjoy it. Uh, one year ago, we started to do like our own food lab. It's called Manoy Food Lab. Um, the goal is like to um, using all the local ingredients and then turn it into like the seasoning product. Uh, sometimes we get like the um, garum, sometimes we get uh, a shoyu that make from like different types of grain that are available in this region. And the inspiration is just like um, when you have like new flavor from your food lab. So then when you see things that are available from, from like the um, local market, the seasonal ingredients, and then use your creativity how to season the, the seasonal product with the flavor from your food lab you know, and then on and on, and then tell the story behind that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not great in front of the camera, so I'll try my best. Yeah, I'm a little pissed. One, it's gonna be one year that you won't be eating sun. It was like four months. Yeah, man. The first time I came to Thailand, it really blew my mind. Like, uh, you guys have sort of experienced here eating, eating crazy things, like even in one day eating like ants eggs, and eating meat mild, and like, all these things. So, um, and then this is like the dipping sauce, and that tastes like the shit. Things in this region are just so undervalued, but for me and Noon, we see so much value, and it's like, why, why is it like that? So we, uh, you know, we try to we try to change that. Yeah. And what do you have going on here today? Just off the this is actually just my lunch, so uh, <laughs> yeah, my dinner. So maybe not something so interesting, but uh, maybe I can walk around and show you a few like. Yeah. Um, of course, fermentation can be wild and it can be um, spontaneous and like less controlled. But we like to control as many variables as we can, so we can keep nailing a consistent result. Um, that kind of goes hand in hand with like you know showing the value in this region if we can have like nice consistent products. So we we use chambers to control temperature and humidity for the most part. Um, so this one here is just like an old fridge, but we, we control it with the thermostat here. Um, so we keep it like quite low. Um, so this one we like to do 
um, alcohols and vinegars and like sweet sauces. Uh, so we have like a bunch of stuff in here. Um, I can show you one. This is like um, a ferment we do with the local chilies, uh, inspired by Japanese kanzuri. So we salt the chilies for like two months, um, and then we mix it with um, different enzymes, and then we're, we let it go for like another six months. Um, you get like a really flavorful, like sour, spicy umami paste. Um, and then we do like a lot of bigger projects like this. So I'll just pull this out now for you. This is our like food chemist. Yeah, yeah. In a way. So this one is our is our soy sauce. So um, yeah, this is like um, a percentage of yeah. So we use the organic soybeans from this region, um, as well as wheat berries. And so we roast off the wheat, and we mix it with the soy, and then we grow um, an edible mold on it that facilitates the fermentation. Then we just dump in a brine of about 20% salt, and then we just give it like a mix every week for just about six months, and then we press out our soy sauce. So we started in the beginning, we started with like a bunch of small batches, and then we landed on like ones that we really like, and we scale up the batch, um, yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, my name is it's originating from uh, you know, ancient Roman times. Essentially how it started was like uh, fish and salt. And the, the gut enzymes of the fish would slowly break down the proteins into glutamic acid, which is just tsunami. So uh, you get like a really, really powerful sauce. And so there's, uh, very, there's a lot of parallels between that and Thai fish sauce. Uh, so we play with that idea here. Instead of using the, the gut enzymes from the fish, we use koji, which is like a gold from Japan. So we grow the koji on different substrates like rice or barley. And then we use that to convert the proteins into umami. So, uh, for example, like we don't have too much in here right now, but uh, like this one here, we use the subterranean ants. So we take a percentage of ants, koji, salt, and water, we blend it together, and then hold it at 50 Celsius. So at 50, the, the enzymes here are extremely efficient. So like uh, the traditional garum will take like a year to make. So we just like have a balance depending on what we're making. Um, so yeah, just more insect garums in here. We have silkworm garum. This is one of my oh, favorites. So we oh take wow. the silkworms and we uh, we roast them on the barbecue and then we smoke them before we make the garum. So at the end, like this thing tastes like bacon juice. It's, it's pretty. It's pretty wow. crazy. So all your garums have a distinct flavor. Yeah, yeah. Depending on the protein that we're using, and then also we can employ different techniques. Like some some of my favorites are we take like the local frogs and we barbecue them first, and then we. Uh, uh, we make the garum and it tastes like tri uh, chicken drippings off like rotisserie chicken or something like that. Yeah, we have a we do pastry in the kitchen too, and so it requires a lot of egg yolks. So we're left with like a shit ton of egg whites in the end. So with, instead of wasting them, we because it contains a lot of protein, we just change that protein to glutamic acid. So we make a garum out of the egg whites. It's just our dry aged chamber. So like we do a lot of um, we'll make like vegan cheeses from pumpkins, and we'll, we'll uh, dry them out in here. We'll do chorizo from like local. Um, local pork or like different types of uh, charcuterie. So uh, this, this one here, I think this is a project of Dooms. I think it's fish bacon. Uh, hard to take a guess. Because um, we've done that one in the past, but yeah. Has that, have you made purchase. one before? Like, is this your first attempt at fish we, bacon? We've done it, yeah. It's, it's, it's quite good. Actually, we take inspiration from Josh in, uh, in, in Australia. The only challenge here is it, it, there's only freshwater fish, so it tastes quite muddy, so like we have to find the right fish. Use the right combination of smoke and spices to kind of like make it palatable. Yeah, yeah. but it works. Sure. After you do the research about like the, um, what's the local wisdom, um, that's it to local ingredients. Um, you is, you got to you got to see on the board side what it's good or what it's bad. Okay, the good thing we keep it or you can twist it a little bit if, if, it, if it's good to us. We analyze more on what is the bad side, you know. Um, most of the time, we found that like uh, the local wisdom or the local technique um, cannot make the flavor bring out more or in terms of like the easy for people outside to understand. We consider the the modern fermentation technique can help us to to turn like the um, the local flavor to something else. So that's why, like, um, to me, if the technique can can bring the local Isan ingredients to something else, something new, 
something that never exists before, but it's very nice. I think we should do it. I don't see why not. Yeah. We make the um, our own miso from um, peanuts and back bean. You know, so that like uh, we turn it to village and we season it with um, water buck and we chop some like the green mango into it and then we, you eat it with like frozen the local vegetable that had like five different flavors into it. Uh, this captured the essence of Samoyan sons who love to work with insects and um, some of them they, they have different uses right and one of our favorites is the, the silkworm. It's, it's like super uh, creamy in texture but it's also very nutty in flavor so we think about it, it has a lot of uh, interesting applications for desserts so this one here is a uh, it's inspired by like pocket cream so we set like a custard from the silkworms um, and we make like a salted caramel sauce from one of the garams we make from silkworm as well um, and then on top we just have some local fruits and some dried silkworm as well wow uh, on, on top is a crisp of bale fruit so um just like break through it and kind of get every every component in each bite so it's like balanced out. What inspired me, it's... I think it's the nature and then also like the... Um, um, since I decided I'd like to focus more on my region and I think it's just like... Uh, um, there are so many... so many many stuff that like uh, people should know about um, my region, yeah. If we still continue doing what we do today, um, I hope that like one day people can fully understand like, oh, Isan food or Isan cuisine, it has more interesting things, you know. We would love to share this information to, to the people. You're welcome. Do I have to take this out or? It with me all day.